in the beginning we were talking about the consumer uh, kind of like a cons we were actually talking about labor and we were just saying the things we do for ourselves sometimes we don't even think of that as labor and that actually uh, the labor we'd think about of going to work is really should be designed to support our lifestyle and uh, I was just thinking like in the tradition where all our actually economic systems grew up in let's say that there's a, th a third generation factory and it's grown uh, not to make too much history about it but just let's say it's up even around 20 or 30 or 50 million dollars now in a, in a, in a mid-sized Ohio town and uh, and the whole family and several generations of the family work there and hundreds of employees work there and they're they're pretty modern and so on as far as what kind of product they have and how they sell it and how they distribute it but still that company is very much in sync and in, in uh, with the community and it's still serving and it, it probably even has ideals of uh, how we serve our employees and we have daycare centers here and we you know somehow we serve our community and they they might be members of the rotary and members of you know the YMCA and they're giving to uh, different charities and different uh, children's events and schools and supporting the university and so on and so on and they're actually uh, they're very much in sync with that that community that they're they're paying taxes they're uh, you know they're dip relying on that labor market uh, they're supporting that college uh, they're maybe doing research with that college and so on and so on and then they get bought and they get bought by this ac accumulated capital that we were talking about, that this, this uh, excess wealth. And now, instead of 100% of this family being tied into this community, never thinking of leaving it, no way they could ever even leave it. There's no way they could really finance or get liquid enough without uh, issuing stock and so on. There's no way they could really rebuild everything from ground zero. But some big group comes in there. And now this factory of 50 million is 1% of this big group. And they don't have any allegiance to anywhere, and they're gonna—they hold that community uh, at ransom and say, "Look, we're closing this factory down. Give us a 20-year ho tax holiday. We have to lay off half your your people here because, just like you said, with the insurance company, they do the actuaries or they do the other stuff somewhere else, and they do the accounting somewhere else, and the billing somewhere else, and the and the sales force is located somewhere else, and you know, and then they have all these other maybe a hundred other industries." that are all supporting this huge cash flow that actually they could say, well, let's just shut this down and we'll move over to some new town that'll give us a 20 year tax holiday. And uh, by the way, they're a non-union town. And uh, this old factory that's 40 or 50 years old, uh, let's, it's about time we got rid of that anyhow. And then uh, they just kind of like, uh, they're traders and choppers, you know, they just chop up what they get and then they, they take the goods and, uh, and they, they've got the, the, the structural capital that allows them to do that where the third generation guy didn't have, you know, he was making a good living and all. Right. So then we're, we live in a, in a totally different atmosphere of where our institutions grew up. Yeah, yeah. certainly, certainly. And I think part of it is we've, we've misappropriated the power over these. Over and we've divorced facts. it from the community, totally divorced it. Right, right. You know, I mean, I, I tend to think of, uh, you know, from traditional law, from British law, we, 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 where we get the idea of a corporation. And a corporation was, was any kind of collective or enduring, uh, was, was an entity to satisfy any collective or enduring need. You know, so a, a town was a corporation, a city is a corporation. The colonies, the original 13 colonies of, of America were, were also corporations. And um, so there were certain kinds of corporations where we would have, would have never... And traditionally, none of the corporations, we would have ever thought of sole selling ownership of them. They were simply a way of organizing our collective needs. And so it was kind of a strange opportunistic innovation that, that thought of selling stock in that corporation. Uh, was there just no ownership or was it just uh, uh, understood that everyone owns it? I, I think uh, I think it didn't really have the modern conceptions of ownership that we that we uh, all take for granted today. I think it was just simply something that was there. It existed, you know, like, uh, you know, if you think of a, a city of here in, in Forest Park, it's 
no one ever really thinks that they own the town. I mean, maybe maybe they, they think of that a little bit, but I think it's more just, it just is. It's just Yeah, we just town. become a resident and a taxpayer. And right. then we're a citizen because we pay taxes to this. And you, and you live here. And yeah. the resident only takes 90 days or whatever. Right, right. So, but weren't the original 13 colonies actually uh, commercial uh, charters that England gave certain uh, trading companies? or There, there were those too, the long side of it. I mean, the East India Trading Company was a separate kind of corporation, um, but the, there was the, the Virginia was a corporation in Connecticut and New York, and these were chartered by the, the King of England uh, through Parliament. But the understanding was it was the king's, you know, prerogative to to charter a corporation to, and and of course the it was an unusual then to charter a monarchical or an oligarchical corporation to say, you're the governor of Connecticut, that's it, we're done. There's no election goes on or anything. So part of the uh, the American Revolution was a recognition that we should have local rule, and we should have uh, republican governance as they called it, or we call it democracy today. We should have democracy in these colonies. And we should decide our own fate here locally. And so they suppl- supplanted that governor appointed and instead put together constitutions in each and created states and, and, uh, and each colony became a state and became an, uh, one with a Republican form of gover- governance. And I think we should have thought of a, a corporate enterprise, uh, except for, you know, you have the East India Company and these early uh, enterprise corporations that uh, kind of set set us on the wrong path and where we actually sold stock in them. And I think instead we should have thought of it as another way for government to organize our collective enduring needs of production, allow them to be separate, allow them to be private, but at the same time not allow them to be owned, but rather be financed through bond issue, uh, just through borrowing. Um, and not When the king them. said that you're the governor of Rhode Island, he probably said, he didn't say that you own Rhode Island. He said, I own Rhode Island, right? I uh, mean, it's my colony and it, you're just uh, the governance. Yeah, he thought of it. As, it right? He thought of it as his domain. Uh, so it's different than ownership because one of the things we think of a key aspect of ownership is what what uh, the legal profession calls alienation. So when you can sell something, you can alienate it. You can make it someone else's property. That's where ownership comes in. The king never thought of some of the colonies as something he could alienate. It was his domain always. He could take it from the governor and give it to a different governor. He could restructure them and, and reshape the boundaries of them. He could do all that, but he couldn't actually sell them off. He couldn't. Wasn't make them there the Louisiana the territory that we bought from France? It, it was from France, but again, that was after the French Revolution. That was after these new innovations in natural resource stewardship had begun, where uh, where the the king of France had been, you know, supplanted also, and so now. And an alienation was starting to occur with natural resources. They were starting to treat natural resources just like any other commodity, not as something of the domain of government, but as rather something just just like a you know a bottle of whiskey or something. You could just alienate it. So, so I mean, talking about the French Revolution, I, you know, in our preamble it says uh, right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But wasn't that originally uh, life, liberty, and property? And we didn't. We decided that we didn't want to say that you could have property. That's not part of our constitution. Or, or well, then life, liberty, and property. That phrase does show up in the constitution again. Uh, you know, it, it's not a question of, of so much. Uh, again, property is all, uh, often a very central part of, of our our polity, the way we relate to each other as citizens. But um, but there's a difference in you know what can be property. What can you own? You know, can you own a person? You know, that was something you could do early on. Can you, could you own natural resources to the extent of being able to alienate them, to sell them to someone else? Or was it something granted to you? I mean, that's what title was. It was a grant, a temporary grant from your superior, the king maybe, um, which granted you that use of that land, use of that natural resource, including the right to, to extract rents and taxes from those who you subgranted, you sublicensed uh, that land, or to extract the mineral riches, or yeah, so on. we all, have a, we have a somehow a lease or a, a lease to uh, to work the mineral rights on certain lands and to explore for oil and gas and right exactly and, and I mean that's often what the explorers were they were going and claiming the new lands as the domain of their of their king whoever uh, sponsored them. In some senses, we say there's rights to alienate uh, much property, right? And then when it comes to something like our imbalance of trade, and it turns out that China has so many dollars and it's, they're not very worth very much as a deposit in somebody's bank account, 
and they want to come over here and just buy a lot of land and buy a lot of buildings and and we're wondering if that's a uh, right that they have to buy it. Uh, it can we alienate and they to a foreign national or a foreign uh, actually a foreign nation and uh, so then that's where kind of like alienation is breaking down right I, that's a very interesting point you raise. I mean, because it does, I think, highlight the the kind of uh, the contradictions in in allowing that kind of alienation. You know, if you imagine, what if China, like the you, the federal government today, owns twenty five percent of the land in in, in the North, in North America in our national forests and our national parks. You know, if you imagine, what if China bought that? You know, what if they owned? They could do it easily, right? <laughs> so, I mean, they've got that liquid, so kind of, liquidity. To do right, it, right. It breaks down what it means to be a nation. If 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 China owned one hundred percent of the land in North America, you know, then in what sense are we the United States of America? Um, and and we're seeing that even you know that there's it's one way to think of it in terms of foreigners, but even domestically, if if one person or one one corporation owns all of the land in North America, we we don't have. You know, our free speech rights, they're based on public space. And if we don't have any public space anymore, uh, we, don't, we don't even have our free speech rights. You, you can go to home to your apartment and you can speak freely, but you can't ever go anywhere else and speak freely. So. Yeah.